Hello, I'm Sherry Hamill, and I would like to welcome you to Architreats Food for Thought, sponsored by Friends of the Alabama Archives. I have a few announcements today. Uh, first of all, we would like to invite you to join us for a book talk on Friday, November 1st at noon here at the Archives. It is sponsored by the Alabama Historical Commission, and this special event will feature Mississippi photographer Eric Etheridge, who will discuss Breach of Peace, Portraits of the 1961 Mississippi Freedom Riders. A selection of Etheridge's photos are currently on display at the Freedom Rides Museum in downtown Montgomery. We hope you can join us. Also, plan to attend Architreats next month on November 21st as James Day presents Diamonds in the Rough, a history of Alabama's Cahaba coal field. Also, make plans for next year on February the 8th, 2014, Cultural Crossroads, Creek War of 1813 to 1814, sponsored by Landmarks Foundation and Alabama Department of Archives and History. Uh, keep a watch for the registration on our website and make plans to attend. It's always a lot of fun. Our Architreats programs are made possible by a grant from the Alabama Humanities Foundation. You should have received an evaluation form. Please complete the evaluation form and return it to us before you leave today. Today's speakers, David and Jeannie Heidler, are natives of Atlanta, Georgia. They met at Auburn University, where both received their PhDs in United States history. After teaching at Colorado State University Pueblo, David retired from the classroom and now devotes himself full-time to writing. Jeannie is currently Professor of History and Director of the American History at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado. The Heidlers have written or edited numerous articles and 12 books on American history, including the Encyclopedia of the War of 1812. One of their titles is available uh, in our gift shop, Old Hickory's War, Andrew Jackson, and the Quest for Empire. They will be available to autograph your books after the program is over. Please welcome David and Jeannie Heidler. Well, hello everyone. Gosh, if we'd known you were coming, we would have prepared something. <laughs> I have an announcement to make. Uh, first of all, the Alabama Historical Association pilgrimage is going to occur on Saturday, this Saturday, at Horseshoe Bend, and will proceed as planned. You can register there at the park if you've not registered already, beginning at 9 uh, a.m., and the program begins at 10. If you haven't, as I say, registered, you can do so then at the park, and uh, Jean and I will be there, in fact. Uh, we will be uh, like bad pennies showing up, uh, showing up there. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, here at the archives for helping bring us here. We've, uh, we were invited by Debbie Pendleton, who's always a good friend and, and a kind colleague, and uh, those who have made uh, the visit uh, Outstanding and characteristically gracious, uh, gracious is uh, 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 Sherry Hamill, who has uh, uh, taken us under her wing this morning, and uh, and Kevin Nutt, who has made uh, the technical aspects of this uh, caper pretty uh, pretty easy. In fact, it's always a wonder uh, that, that that these things come off, and we 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 are possibly knocking on wood in that regard, because the night is young and we just don't know what will happen here. With this. This, uh, <clears throat> this has occurred to us before when uh, halfway through a program, I finally just stopped with the power, it was PowerPoint at that time, and I said, uh, I'm kind of interested to see what's going to happen next myself, <laughs> even though we had designed it. Um, so we will, uh, we will be talking today about the uh, War of 1812 as it uh, closed in Alabama. And as a consequence of it happening here in the last part of the war, 
there is a, a prologue that we have prepared to bring us up to speed in a fairly uh, quick fashion. So if you uh, would uh, uh, attend the screen, we'll see if this is going to, this is going to work. <laughs> had been matched with atrocities on both sides. Uh, the, the evacuation of, of uh, the Niagara River region by the British had been marked by catastrophic work uh, of, uh, of, of American militia, burning towns in the dead of winter, and forcing Canadian, uh, British Canadians to, to, to seek refuge wherever they could, often in knee-deep snow. The, uh, the destruction of Buffalo, New York followed there were instances of prisoners, American prisoners, American soldiers trying to become prisoners, being bayoneted to death by British soldiers who were uh, exacting revenge. The entire campaign in the wake of Napoleon Bonaparte's abdication and exile uh, to Elba was uh, in North America one based upon vengeance as much as strategy. The, the uh, British assault in Maryland that culminated in the occupation of Washington, D.C., mentioned here, the burning of the public buildings there, most noticeably the Capitol, and the executive mansion, not yet called the White House. It would be afterwards because they would whitewash it when they rebuilt it. Those acts were more symbolic than meaningful in, in terms of any tactics or strategy. Baltimore was a bit different because Baltimore was a haven for privateers. Privateers that had plagued the British Navy and merchant shipping in the Caribbean throughout the war, essentially once the frigates, the famous frigates like the Constitution, the President, uh, were, were uh, bottled up uh, after 1813, uh, essentially, the only Navy America had were the privateers working under letters of mark. Baltimore was their center of operation and hence was a target for, for revenge, as well as booty, the treasures of a city that was known for its port uh, capabilities and its trade uh, nexus within the region uh, offered incredible amounts of prize and treasure to, uh, to British captains uh, and admirals who planned the operation, only frustrated there by their inability to reduce Fort McHenry in a timely way. The withdrawal from Baltimore put the British in mind of a softer underbelly. Let's see if we can get this to work now.
the soft underbelly of the United States of America, which was the Gulf Coast. And as a consequence, the war would end here, uh, not at New Orleans, but at Mobile, with the last battle of the war being on, um, on February, in February of 1815. Now we know that those engagements, including New Orleans, and the last battle at Mobile Point occurred after the Treaty of Ghent had been signed, the famous Christmas Eve peace, which is often taken to, to, to be that the war's end is irrelevant in its final engagements. Uh, New Orleans was more of, a, of an instance of America coming away from the conflict, which had been militarily disappointing, with a sense of pride and accomplishment through Jackson's successful defense of the Crescent City. And likewise, the notion that Mobile's last engagement in February of 1815 was a, was a result of the British attempting to salve wounded pride and uh, re recoup some of the military grandeur that had been wasted on the, on the flats of the Chalmette Plain in front of Rodriguez Canal at New Orleans, which had been turned into a charnel house by the Americans. The uh, last attack in February of, uh, of uh, 1815 on Mobile Point is thus dismissed as irrelevant. The Battle of New Orleans is at best a, uh, an American uh, bauble, uh, an accomplishment without meaning. This is wrong because, in fact, the war was over, technically, with the Christmas Eve peace. with the Treaty of Ghent having established the concept that all territory that had been taken during the war would be returned immediately to each side. The concept often uh, compressed into the, uh, into the phrase, the status quo antebellum, the situation as it existed before the conflict, before the war. It is our contention that had this not worked out the way it did in, uh, in the Gulf Coast engagements, that that very concept would have been at risk. And the war, although the treaty had been signed on Christmas Eve, it had not been ratified. And that victory at New Orleans would have given the British a great deal more leverage to exact more draconian concessions. Ghent had been a nightmare for the American commissioners there. They had arrived at a time when the tide in battle was turning the British way. The campaigns of 1814, as they uh, unfolded during the summer of 1814, the news of those campaigns reaching European shores devastated the American commissioners led by John Quincy Adams and including Henry Clay and Albert Gallatin. The news of Washington's destruction, Washington, D.C.'s destruction. Carrying that were sent over to Henry Clay by his counterpart on the British Commission. As a favor, he said in his cover letter, to keep you up to date with events at home. It was from that vantage that they were negotiating best they could with a group of people who were obviously stalling hoping for even better news that would allow them to exact even greater concessions. It is a tribute to the men who sat at the tables at, in, in Ghent uh, talking to the British commissioners that they did hold firm, that they would not be bullied, they would not be cowed, and they would not be discouraged. There was a sense that something would happen, something would work out right. And, as it did, it did. <clears throat> the British plan, as it was unfolding after Baltimore's, uh, the September uh, disappointment at Baltimore that was hatched in, um, in the Bahamas, was to take New Orleans. New Orleans was an even richer prize than Baltimore. And, in fact, as many of you might know, the British call words for the uh, campaign were booty and beauty. How to take 
New Orleans. The question of doing it effectively was to take Mobile. And here's why. Alexander Cochran, who planned this campaign, quite rightly knew that New Orleans was a difficult objective, primarily because of its situation geographically. It sits on a bend of the river, and hence is called the Crescent City, which makes it very difficult to reach uh, by water in any naval, a force of any naval, uh, naval force of any size. It is also situated in such a way with Lake Pontchartrain to its east and a very marshy uh, ground and bayous to the south and the west of it. It makes it very difficult to, to place troops there in any meaningful way unless it is approached from the north. And for that reason, Mobile was going to be the staging area for the New Orleans campaign. The key to that was Fort Boyer. Fort Boyer, which sat on Mobile Point, protected Mobile Bay. It was not a stronghold. It was a makeshift stockade at best, not very well protected from the east. It was easily reduced. And once easily reduced, the British could take the Navy into Mobile Bay, control it, and take New Orleans, or take Mobile, as a prelude to the move on New Orleans. Yeah. This would initiate the overland campaign, which would head west to Baton Rouge, head south down the Mississippi River, in conjunction with the Royal Navy moving into the area outside of Lake Pontchartrain and up the Mississippi River at the same time, securing both the western and eastern approaches to the city it was impossible to defend, even if it had been defended by a stalwart, well-manned force. There was no way the British, once they got into the interior of the United States of America, moving across the Mississippi Territory toward the Mississippi River, well supplied through the control of Mobile Bay, protecting their lines of communications through Mobile all the way on that march and meet, meeting up with the Royal Navy forces that were coming up from the Gulf here, New Orleans will fall. It cannot be defended. The key to all of this, this huge vault door, was a tiny jeweled bearing called Fort Boyer. All 128 men of it. How best to start this campaign? That was the question. How best to start quickly? Because time was of the essence. They knew they were negotiating and again. How best to start the campaign to make it work quickly, gain mobile, and commence the overland march as quickly as possible? To that end, Captain Hugh Piggott, who was in charge, uh, in command of the HMS Orpheus, contacted Indian allies in the Gulf Coast region, primarily the Seminole and Creek Indians at, uh, who had gathered at Apalachicola as, uh, as refugees, really, from the, uh, from the Creek War, which had been taking place in the, uh, in the Mississippi Territory to the north. There, in addition, they sent Captain George Woodbine to Prospect Bluff, Apalachicola, to meet with those Indians and recruit them as the principal allies and augmentation of the forces to move on Fort Boyer. The combined conjunct conjunctive operation, which would result in the reduction of a very easy objective and then the plucking of the town at the head of the bay, was supposed to proceed uh, with dispatch as the British uh, correspondingly moved. to contact Red Stick Creeks, 
who had gathered in the area of Pensacola. Who were these people called Red Sticks? Uh, Dr. Catherine Braun, who is somewhere out there in the audience, would be the best person to explain that, but she's in the audience, so I'm going to give it a, give it a shot here. Uh, the Red Sticks, and I'm sure you've heard from some of your programs uh, before, were the, that faction of the Creeks that resisted acculturation. Uh, this is somewhat of an oversimplification that I'm sure Dr. Braun will tell me about after the program is over. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, these, the Red Sticks fought in the Creek War uh, against those Creeks who were less opposed to acculturation. And of course, some of them were actually in favor of it. Uh, the Creek War coincided with the opening of the War of 1812. Uh, and unhappily mel melded with it when territorial militia clashed with the Red Sticks at Burnt Corn Creek in the summer of 1813. The Red Stick attack on the settlement at Fort Mims, uh, a settlement consisting to a large degree of people of mixed Creek white heritage, uh, that occurred a month after Burnt Corn Creek, and it brought territorial militia into the Creek War territorial militia from the Mississippi Territory, from Georgia, and probably most famously from Tennessee, uh, came into what is now Alabama as a result of Fort Mims. The most relentless of those commanders, of course, was Andrew Jackson, who broke the back of the Red Sticks at Horseshoe Bend on the Tallapoosa River in March of 1814. This ultimately led to the Treaty of Fort Jackson, uh, a treaty that was dictated to the Creek Nation to primarily those Creeks who had allied with the United States. Uh, and in that treaty, Jackson seized from the Creeks 23 million acres, uh, what he referred to as the cream of the Creek country. That treaty in addition to their defeat in the war, so demoralized the Red Sticks that many of them did flee to Florida. They moved to the vicinity of Pensacola, some of them, and seemed ripe for enlistment in the British cause. This was not lost on Jackson. And in fact, he sent word to the Spanish governor at Pensacola, Mateo Gonzalez Manrique, to turn the Creeks over to him, those red sticks that, who had fled down there. Uh, Gonzalez Manrique refused, uh, but this is sort of the beginning of his uh, concern that ultimately Jackson might be coming to Pensacola. Instead, Woodbine went to Pensacola, uh, the British captain uh, that David had talked about earlier. And he began organizing the Red Sticks there uh, to resist and perhaps to help with an attack on Mobile. The British began to coil the spring at Pensacola. More British ships and Marines arrived in Florida, including Royal Marine Lieutenant Colonel Edward Nichols. New, these new arrivals tried also to recruit the Spaniards uh, to help them with this attack on Mobile. Uh, the Spaniards refused, but the training of the Red Sticks and the Seminoles continued. The reason why the Spaniards refused, it's not really clear but it's probably because Gonzalez Manrique, in particular, was concerned about the possible retribution of Andrew Jackson if he participated in any attack on the Americans. So Nichols and Captain Percy of the Hermes decided to undertake the attack on Fort Boyer with only their Indian allies and the roughly 130 Royal Marines that they had with them for the attack. Now everyone knew how important Mobile was. Uh, and in fact, when the war started, Mobile was a Spanish town. Uh, and the Americans realized its importance not only as a port city, but as that possible backdoor 
to New Orleans, and that is one of the reasons why General James Wilkinson uh, was given the go-ahead in the spring of 1813 to actually seize Mobile from Spain, even though we were at peace with Spain, uh, and turn it into an American town and fortify it for the United States. So now we are ready for the first attempt on Fort Boyer. The preparations by the British were complete, at least the military preparations, but Captain Percy actually sent an invitation to the infamous Baratarian pirate, Jean Lafitte, uh, asking him to help, not just with the attack on Mobile, but the entire Gulf campaign. Uh, Jean Lafitte, who perhaps looked like this, or that, or that, or even this. <laughs> this, of course, is, is Yul Brenner, who plays Jean Lafitte in the, the movie The Buccaneer. Uh, in other words, we're not really sure what Jean Lafitte looked like, uh, but we do actually have his response uh, to Captain Percy, which was no. Uh, Jean Lafitte hated the British. Plus, he feared the British. Now, you might think, well, if he feared the British, why wasn't he willing to help them? He feared their navy, because the British navy, of course, could put an end to the way he made a living, which was pirating. Whereas the United States, who he also hated, really didn't have the ability to put an end to his pirating. And so ultimately, after saying no to the British, Jean Lafitte will throw in with the Americans and be of considerable help to Andrew Jackson at New Orleans. In addition to what Captain Percy did, uh, Edward Nichols sent an invitation as well. He issued a proclamation to the natives of Louisiana, called on them and of course he means those people of French and Spanish descent who were still there. Were still there. He asked them to assist him in liberating their paternal soil from a faithless imbecile government. He was referring to the American government. None of these people came to the British aid either. Instead, the British and their Indian allies went it alone. Four British ships left Pensacola in September of 1814. Two sloops and two brigs led by Captain Percy's HMS Hermes. With them were those 130 Marines and 600 Indian allies who were landed east of the fort Fort Boyer, and they had two small little field pieces, pieces of artillery, to use against the fort. These proved to be ineffective, largely because they couldn't get close enough to the fort to actually do a great deal of damage. The ships, on the other hand, were spotted by the fort, off of the fort, uh, at the entrance to the bay, on September 12th. 1814. Uh, the first shots were exchanged on September 13th. The next day the wind wasn't right and so the ships couldn't really get close to the fort. Instead, the next morning they went out into the bay so that they could maneuver better and then moved against the fort in a line of battle, all the while hoping that the land forces would be able to get close enough to storm from the land side. And so as they sail past the fort in line of battle, they began firing broadsides at the fort. And then of course the fort returned fire. It was uh, horrifically noisy according to all of the people uh, who witnessed it. Now as this was happening, the ships, of course, as they sailed by the fort, then would have to turn around, so it would take a while, and then come by and fire more broadsides on the fort. And of course, the fort was firing on them at the same time. Ultimately, the flagship, the Hermes, uh, was struck and disabled and drifted aground within range of the fort. 
And so there the fort was, for, was able to really pound the Hermes. On board was Lieutenant Colonel Nichols. He had been sick when they left Pensacola, and so therefore he had had to be on the ship rather than it part of the landing force. And the splinters that flew because of the fort firing on the ship uh, were just horrific. I mean, they were going everywhere, and one of them actually entered Lieutenant Colonel Nichols' right eye. Uh, he survived. In fact, he was going to suffer a number of wounds that day, and he survived all of them, though he, of course, lost his eye in the attack. The crew aboard the Hermes ultimately had to abandon ship uh, because it was just so horrible what they were uh, experiencing. But before they did so, they set fire to the ship so that it wouldn't fall into American hands. Uh, and when that fire reached the powder stored below decks, the ship exploded. They could hear that explosion of the Hermes all the way in Mobile. And the rest of the British ships took that as a symbol that it was time to go. They retreated away from Fort Boyer. Their Indian allies and Marines retreated overland. And the United States had a new hero, Major William Lawrence, who commanded those 128 men who withstood this attack on Fort Boyer. He received the con uh, congratulations of Congress, and he was promoted to lieutenant colonel as a result of his actions there. Now, the significance of this battle, which, you know, in the overall scheme of things is kind of a small battle. When you look at some of the large battles that were being fought in other parts of the country, but the significance of this battle is that now the British were kind of running out of time. You remember what David said about those negotiations in Ghent? They didn't know that the American negotiators were nervous, that they were discouraged about what the way the war was going. The British in America only knew that a treaty could come about at any time. And if a treaty came about and was ratified without them taking New Orleans, then likely they would never get another chance. And so as a result of the British failure in this first battle of Fort Boyer, the more senior British officers in America decided that instead that they would make a direct assault on New Orleans because they were afraid that they were running out of time. Well, the um, time factor was crucial to them. It was of the essence. And the result of this, the, the, the likelihood of peace spoiling these plans, factored into the idea of attacking New Orleans directly also the notion that it would be another instance of militia turning tail and running as they had at Bladensburg outside of Washington, D.C. So using all of those conjectures and sureties, they figured it was worth it. And that is why the New Orleans campaign unfolded the way it did. Andrew Jackson began by attempting to bully Manrique Gonzalez, or Gonzalez Manrique, into surrendering Pensacola. And when he would not, Jackson took it. He moved on it and was able to take it uh, with relatively uh, uh, little uh, resistance from the British. The Spanish would not help them. moving on it and taking it uh, as the British retreated and destroyed all the defenses uh, on Santa Rosa Island and Fort Baracus. They took the defenses down to such a level that Pensacola became impossible to defend itself, and Jackson abandoned it. The 
great fear he had was that the British were planning to go back into Mobile. And to that end, he marched very quickly on Mobile with the idea that uh, Fort Boyer should be reinforced. And it, the, the garrison was about doubled to around 360 men. Jackson sat in Mobile almost too long. He was convinced the British would come back into the bay. And not until it became very apparent that they weren't, that they were moving on, on New Orleans directly, did he leave New Orleans and move there with the urgency of a man already late. And he almost was late. James Winchester was left in Mobile. And he was an extremely nervous man because he was quite undermanned. Jackson had taken most of the people with him west to New Orleans. Winchester tried to take the, the dictum that the best defense is an offense and sent a force on a preemptive assault at Prospect Bluff where the Indians had gathered after the first failed attack on Fort Boyer in September. While this went on, and it was an unsuccessful uh, uh, attempt at Prospect Bluff that only exhausted the men and accomplished nothing else, they never really even got there, uh, the, the mere act of journeying there was, was sufficient to, to deplete them. The news of Jackson's victory at New Orleans arrived in, in uh, Mobile, uh, the January 8, 1815 uh, defeat of the British there that was one of the most astonishing military feats in the history of the world. Uh, an overwhelming British force that should have been uh, easily ensconced in New Orleans within the space of a day or two. It had taken an alarming amount of time to get ready to make the assault, and when they'd finally made it, they'd made it in the worst possible way. The casualties were horrific. The general officers fell along with the rank and file. Pakenham himself, the commanding officer of the, of the operation there on the ground, was dead by the end of the day. Jackson had saved New Orleans, said the country. The British decision then, after New Orleans, was to return to Mobile because the British intended to take New Orleans. They did not care about Mobile. They intended to take New Orleans and they reverted to the original plan take it and march overland and attack the city from the north. And it did not matter if Jackson had been the hero of a thousand battles. He would not have been able to defend New Orleans from that assault any more than he would have been able to defend it earlier in the fall of 1814. That is the reason this happens that February. Beginning in early February, the British are doing this properly. They move on Dauphin Island, putting large numbers of troops there that will eventually be ferried to Mobile Point, the land east of, the, of Fort Boyer, in order to, to uh, make the ground assault there. On February 8, 1815, William Lawrence woke up and saw this. And these are representative of many more ships. The place was a sea of sail. There were ships of the line, 72 gun ships of the line, triple decking British naval vessels that were the finest lethal naval machines on earth. Five of them were standing off Fort Boyer down below uh, uh, Dauphin Island. Numerous support levels the ferrying of British troops by barge onto the spit of land east of the fort. The fort had 360 American effectives. The British landed 5,000 regulars. These were seasoned veterans of the Napoleonic Wars. They had been fighting in Europe for 15 years. This sandy bit of entrenchment and sapping to move on the fort was a day literally at the beach. The British commenced the plan over the next few days, moving the ships into an arc off Mobile Point and entrenching their way toward the, toward the fort uh, in the soft sand so that by February 9th they were within range of it and February 11th they placed a battery just above it about 750 yards from it. 
They'd also established two batteries to the east, just in case some American might meander into the region. Nobody was going to have to worry about the rear uh, guard action of these 5,000 regulars. On February 11th, everything in place, they gave uh, Lawrence 30 minutes to surrender. And he had to. There was no way he could even fire a shot in any meaningful way against this force. The batteries alone would have blasted him to smithereens because the eastern part of Fort Boyer was undefended. It was a naval fortification, which is why the British were standing off. No need to bother when you have a half a thousand men who know what they're doing, breathing down less than 400 men's neck. The best he could do was get a day for pride. And the following day, February 12th, he surrendered. The British took them on board their ships as prisoners. And almost immediately, someone <coughs> rode out from some place down the bay and told him the war was over. The treaty had arrived from Europe. It had been ratified. Everything was over, and they, they were done with. And like good professional soldiers and naval officers, they discharged Lawrence and his men on back to Mobile Point, set sail, and left. They were going back to Europe because Napoleon had begun the Hundred Days, the campaign that would end at Waterloo. The British plan of moving against New Orleans through the so-called back door of Baton Rouge via Mobile was a sound one and never fully understood by Andrew Jackson. The early attempts to implement the strategy, however, suffered from a shortage of men, ships, field artillery. When the British finally arrived in the Gulf in sufficient numbers to make the assault, the impatient British commanders decided to use overwhelming British naval superiority to make a direct assault on New Orleans. When that attempt failed for reasons that are more fully explained elsewhere, they turned back to their original strategy. The second attempt on Mobile via Fort Boyer did not occur as some historians have asserted because of a desire to salve British wounded pride but as a genuine effort to take New Orleans from the north and hence wring greater concessions from the American negotiators at Ghent. But again, they ran out of time. September 15, 1814. They ran out of time because of the events on that day. What occurred on September 5, 1814 in an undermanned post <clears throat> on a remote, isolated bit of land at the mouth of Mobile Bay, saved the United States of America because it saved the United States. That day is the We are ready for your questions or comments. Remember, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will see that you get a microphone and speak directly into the microphone so that those that are in the uh, overflow room will be able to hear your questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, David, you had mentioned uh, that the Alabama Historical Society would be attending uh, uh, the, the Ford up. Uh, at Horseshoe Bend on Saturday. Yes, sir. Uh, we are also hosting the Alabama Historical Society tomorrow afternoon uh, from 2 to 4 at Smith Mountain, historic Smith Mountain. And oh, okay. I wanted to let you know uh, to be there. And when I say we, uh, the Cherokee Ridge Alpine Trail Association owns Smith Mountain and the historic restored fire tower. Very good. Thank you for letting us know that. Can you tell us what were Lawrence's losses in the September 1814 attack? Uh, in, in fact, I can. 
Uh, he lost, I believe it was four or five men were killed and uh, about a dozen were wounded. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but it was about four or five died uh, and then uh, about a dozen were injured. So far less than the British lost, uh, particularly uh, the wounded on the ships uh, was extremely high and they lost, I think killed, it was, it was several dozen on the, on the ships, particularly the Hermes su suffered the most casualties. Yep, <coughs> they took a pounding from the British from the sea. Uh, the, the fusillades uh, uh, and broadsides as the, as the line of, of, of ships, they, they were small uh, and they were, uh, their ordnance was not that impressive, but uh, Boyer wasn't that impressive a fort either. Where is Prospect Bluff? I wish we had the map back up. Um, Prospect Bluff is east of Pensacola, up the Apalachicola River. So it's not right down on the Gulf. It's up the river, and it is actually located on a bluff. Uh, after the war was over, a lot of the uh, slaves who had uh, departed from the, the southeast during the War of 1812 actually occupied the British position there where they had done their training, and it became known as Negro Fort. Uh, and that is the fort that was gonna be destroyed by uh, Duncan Clinch in 1816. The United States, Jackson actually, because uh, he was the commander of the Southern Department after the war, was going to send Duncan Clinch down there, uh, as well as some naval gunboats that came up the river. Uh, we're going to bombard that fort. And it's sort of like the Hermes, the, one of the, the shots hit the powder magazine that the British had left behind weapons and powder. Uh, and the fort is no longer there because it was literally blown to smithereens when the powder exploded. Killed most of the inhabitants of the fort as well, which included a, a large number of women and children. Yeah, they say they heard they heard uh, Negro Ford explode in, in Pensacola. Yeah. Oh, I'd say probably within 50 miles. It was Uriah, Bl uh, Uriah Blue was in charge of the expedition, and he uh, uh, had uh, a, a fairly small contingent that was really more to, uh, as a preemptive attack to keep them from coming into Mobile, which was Winchester's great uh, alarm. Uh, the terrain and the, the supply was so poor in that part of the world that they never really got, they, they never engaged anyone in prospect. Honesty. I wanted to ask you if some of the British forces that were at Mobile uh, went back to Europe in time to take part in the Battle of Waterloo. Yes, as, yes, as far as I know, they did. Yeah, uh, they, uh, as you know, Robert Ross was killed at Baltimore, and he was the, the, there was a, some confusion as to command of these people as a result of that when they came into, into the Gulf. And uh, Pakenham did not arrive. Uh, he was the Duke of Wellington's brother-in-law, and he did not arrive until very late in the campaign. And he wasn't pleased with what he saw. What they had done at New Orleans, he was very disturbed about, and probably would not have attacked had, again, there not been an issue of time. And in, in, in essence, by the first week of January, Pakenham finds himself with an army all dressed up and no place to go. And so they, they run the, the January 8th event which could have turned out quite differently if some other things had happened. As Jean says, we, you know, that's discussed elsewhere, but had the Western Bank uh, expedition under Thornton actually taken batteries there and put it up and enfilade on Jackson's lines, he wouldn't have been able to hold the Rodriguez Canal line. He would have crumpled and British could have taken New Orleans quite easily then. So a lot of things were very lucky for Jackson and the Americans at New Orleans. These guys, when they left, uh, they were, you know, they were professional soldiers. They've been at this since 1792 <laughs> and in Europe. And so they went to, uh, they went back and fought in Belgium. Yeah. Yes, 
Now back to the Battle of Fort Boyer, Boyer. Was that just a lucky strike uh, that they attacked and sank the Hermes versus the other ships? Or did they know that the commander was on the Hermes? It was just a lucky strike on their part that they... That yes, they it was luck. And in fact, what happened is the Hermes uh, took a bad shot and it, uh, its rigging was damaged. And when, the, uh, when that happened, it became increasingly difficult to control and it drifted into range of the fort. Up to that point, the, the, uh, the British had been pretty cagey. And so cagey, in fact, that the casualties were a result more of, of the naval bombardment, but it wasn't serious. The, the result of the Hermes drifting into range made it quite vulnerable and why it was dis disabled. In fact, uh, let me add something to that. The um, men manning the guns in Fort Boyer, the, the artillery they had, had not been trained. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they had been taught how to load and fire the weapons, but not how to sight them, not how to judge range. So it was the, the shot that disabled the rigging uh, was absolutely just a lucky shot. And so that's why the, sh now whether or not they would have taken the fort, I mean, that's, that's difficult to say if that hadn't happened uh, because uh, these were relatively small ships. They're not like the ones that come in February. Uh, and again, the land force simply could not get close enough to the fort because they didn't have the artillery. Uh, so even if the Hermes had survived, uh, it's doubtful if they would have taken the fort, but this just cut the whole thing short. Yeah, there's, a, there's an interesting scene in all of this where they, they shoot away one of the, uh, the Union Jacks on one of the ships and they think that that's, they're lowering the colors. <clears throat> so they cease firing. And the British cease firing. And you know, everybody looks around at each other for the better part of 25 to 30 minutes. Meanwhile, Lawrence has had everybody load the uh, ordnance back up. And so they're all standing there and then there's a shot fired from one of the British vessels. And Lawrence says, all right, and every gun at Bauer goes off at the same time. And that's really when they hit the Hermes. And so just a, uh, a wall of, of lead goes out and, you know, the blind hog found the acorn. So. Do we have another question? At the first battle of uh, Fort Boyers, how, what type of guns did the uh, U.S. have? I mean, I went, what kind of guns did the, the U.S. have? Oh, these were uh, uh, mounted. They were mounted. They, they were naval siege guns, and their range was pretty good uh, if they if you knew how to fire them. Uh, they were um, uh, they were they were kind of like mortars, but I'm not sure of the exact caliber of them. I suspect they were 16 to 32 pounders. Uh, contrary to Farragut at Fort Morgan, it doesn't, sound, doesn't seem like the British really needed to reduce Fort Boyer before they could take Mobile. Is that not the case? Well, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, the, the, your, the, the difference is the sail and steam. Um, the, the Navy is able to have a great deal more maneuverability and uh, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead kind of thing can be accomplished when you don't have to depend on the wind. As the Hermes, I mean, that's one of the reasons the Hermes got in trouble was the wind more than, than anything else, the rigging and all. Yeah, and Mobile had forts itself. I mean, they, they had fortifications. And they, they, yes, you're right, they could have gone straight to Mobile, but then they would have had uh, Lawrence and his men in their rear and they would have probably come up and around and, and attacked any landing force. Uh, because again, uh, Woodbine and Nichols, they only had about uh, 130 Marines and then their Indian allies. Uh, and so the, the forces at Mobile probably could have resisted them uh, in time to allow Lawrence to come up and attack their rear. So that's, that's the primary reason why they wanted to reduce Boyer first. In addition, they want a line of communication for provisions and supply because yeah. Mobile was supposed to be the staging area, and that was going to ha be how they supplied their uh, their overland campaign. And if they don't control the mouth of the bay, then that becomes ten tenuous. And and so they wanted to make sure that that was an open line that controlled everything and egress. Yeah. And 
Yeah. And they thought it was going to be easy. Yeah. They really did think it was going to be easy to take the fort, as it was ultimately. We have time for one more question. Is there another question? Uh, if not, the Heidlers will be here after the program. Uh, they'll be glad to talk with you if you would like to speak to them. And we certainly thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.